The new normal is something which we all talk about. But going forward, how do we manage our strategic communication approaches in this what we call unprecedented crisis? Let me just share my screen and move on to my slides to cover a very short presentation on some of the key points I'd like to make for discussion further after the, after the panel session. So my topic for this afternoon is strategic communications in the new normal. As I was saying earlier, this is an unprecedented crisis. We're dealing with an invisible enemy. And when you look at the COVID-19 pandemic, it is at different levels. And you can see that it is a crisis at the global level, at the national level, and at the organization level. This is a crisis that every country, every organization has to deal with because it is so very pervasive. And the problem is that there is so much uncertainty and also disruptions to economic activities, disruptions in society, and so on. But there are two key areas that every country and every organization is focused on. One, how to save lives. And the other, how to save livelihood. And between these two dimensions, there are many things to think about as we go forward in the new normal. In terms of saving lives, we have to think about whether you would be hit by a second wave of infection. As you know, currently there are many countries who are facing a second wave of infection and have to deal with it all over again. Also, going forward, the fear is about imported cases as well. So how do you ensure safe travel between countries? And the huge discussion that's going on right now about vaccines and vaccine production. One, there are many um, successful vaccine research going on. Some look quite positive. But there is no clear answer to whether a vaccine will be available soon. And even if one product is successful, the production may be sometime next year or the end of next year. In terms of livelihood, economic recovery is a huge challenge for countries and for co companies. Uh, countries are also facing huge job loss because of severe hits in many sectors, particularly tourism and aviation sectors. Lots of business closures that we see in every country. And the other major challenge is supply disruptions, supply chain disruptions that organizations have to deal with. So with all these uncertainties that you're faced with, how then do you deal with your communications as you move forward. In the case of Singapore, we are in the second phase, uh, we call it phase two of reopening. In phase two of reopening, schools are open, uh, many of the retail outlets are open, we allow dine-in, and some of the sports facilities and wellness are open. And what is important in this second phase of a reopening is that there are still certain restrictions in terms of wearing a mask whenever you're outside your home and safe distancing rules, which are enforced quite strictly in many places. And social gatherings are limited to five people. So, so there is still some amount of restrictions in phase two of our reopening. 
Other countries are in different stages and they would also have to think about how they've got to enforce certain safeguards as they continue to reopen their country, reopen their economies and reopen their country. I have three key points that I would like to cover in this presentation. One, the focus on internal communications. In the new normal, internal communication is absolutely essential. Our first speaker has already covered some points about internal communications, so I will not do too much uh, discussion here, but just some quick pointers on internal comms. What is important is that in the new norm, you must take care of your employees. This is critical because your employees need to understand what is going, uh, going on in the country, what is going on in their companies, what is expected of them in the new norm. So robust and frequent communications with employees is absolutely essential in this situation. And as they work from homes, uh, they need to know more, you know, they need to be updated with more information. And of course, there should be frequent health advice to their employees so that they continue to stay healthy. One area that you could think about as you move into this area of internal communications is to appoint a communications coordinator. In the past, sometimes internal comms is left entirely to the HR people to deal with. Going forth, is it possible to have some kind of integration between uh, HR uh, coordinators as well as corporate communications coordinators? And in that way, the coordination will ensure that there's consistency in message as you communicate with your employees. And then new work procedures, the BCP measures that needs to be, uh, the business continuity plan uh, measures that needs to be put in place, and all kinds of advisories that are coming from health and other authorities that needs to be shared with your employees. What's important is to sensitize your employees to the virus threat by contextualizing the message for your business. And at the same time as you share information, you must also think about how do I build rapport with my employees and try and engage them on various issues so that you know what is the ground feel you understand their fears and concerns, and you also understand if they have um, a lot of uncertainties that they are facing. So internal comms is critical, and so you have to need you have to put more focus and emphasis on this area of communication. And as I said, the second point that I like to make is that in this new norm, you have to constantly actively engage your stakeholders via the social media space. Now, if you look at the social media landscape, and what's been happening in the last few months, you get a sense of how much has changed in this digital and social media space. These are figures from April 2020. And you can see that out of the population of 7.5, 77 billion of urbanized population. Uh, the number of people on mobile phones is 5.16, internet users is 4.57, and active social media users is 3.81. And this gives you the percentages, and you can see how high the percentages are, particularly in assessing information through mobile phones, that's a 66%. How people are using smartphone and mobile phones, 76%. Uh, laptops, 45 Desktop, 32%. And tablet devices, 22%. So very high usage of smartphones again. And what about online and digital activities, that's also increased tremendously in the first few months. And these are figures taken at the end of uh, March 
and it covers the age group of 16 to 64 in uh, selected. Do they plan to continue with these new behaviours? And when this was asked, again, you can see that 20% will say yes, they will continue even after uh, COVID-19, or perhaps I should say in the new normal. And um, spending more time on social media, 15% say yes, they will continue to do so and so on. So these figures also shows that some of the behaviors that are now prevalent will continue in the new normal. Significant changes in media habits, the behavior going forth, it's not gonna drop immediately. So there would be a certain significant continuation of these media habits. What are the social media platforms which are very active? As at April 2020, it is still Facebook, followed by YouTube and WhatsApp. Should brands advertise as per normal? Again, you can see that um, a lot of people in this age group of 16 to 64 uh, approve it strongly approve, somewhat approve, neither approve nor disapprove. So you can find a very high percentage of both males and females believe that you should advertise as normal, in the new normal. Spending more time shopping online, of course this has gone up tremendously with lockdowns and uh, people are buying lots of things online, particularly grocery items. But beyond that, um, other products have also seen a significant increase uh, of online shopping. And uh, right at the top of the... So besides um, how the social media space looks like, governments are also using social media during COVID-19. And here you find that um, the Singapore government has used gov.sg WhatsApp channel during this last five, four months uh, to reach a mass audience. Um, and the subscription was something like 7,000 when they started and it reached 900,000 subscribers in 10 weeks. And that's because the government was using this gov.sg WhatsApp channel as a main channel to reach to the masses about daily updates, providing advisories, providing um, information about some of the situations every day, what's being done, and so on and so forth. And if there are anything which they need to alert people to, they also do that through this channel. So the subscription rate, I think by now could be a million. But uh, this was in 10 weeks. Uh, I think this figure was sometime in uh, June. But figures must have gone up uh, tremendously. So using social media um, is effective in a crisis, as you all know. But governments are now relying heavily on social media as well to reach the audience. So in the case of Singapore, Besides this uh, gov.sg WhatsApp channel, the government is also using gov.sg Telegram and Twitter since April uh, 2020. And this is to complement all the other platforms that they're using, such as the online portal for gov.sg, the Facebook, Instagram, and WhatsApp platforms. So all these platforms together um, has also raised uh, social media consumption in Singapore. So some of the key observations that I like to make based on what you see in the media landscape is that organizations and companies need to have a very strong presence in the digital and social media space. You have to be there. And secondly, you have to actively engage your stakeholders through these different channels uh, with good content and particularly video com content which is very popular. So how you engage your stakeholders is something you have to carefully consider. Look for the right channels and platforms to reach your target audience. And lots of good opportunities for doing digital advertising as well. Uh, but how you do it is
But certainly you must be present on social media space and look at how you can engage your key stakeholders using the right channels and platforms. Now let me move to the third point that I'd like to make, that traditional media is still relevant and trusted, and therefore it provides you with a captive audience. Before COVID-19, many of us were talking about how traditional media was facing challenging times because of declining readership and viewership. But during COVID-19, you find that things have changed. So for example, TV engagement in 25 countries as tracked by Nielsen shows a tremendous increase in um, the number of hours that people have put in watching TV and this is at a very high uh, increase in March 2020. And this is the early part of the crisis. So now you can, if you, if you extrapolate this further, you would uh, presume and, or you can assume that the consumption of TV, news and so on would have gone up even further. In Singapore, uh, Singapore's news consumption has also gone up tremendously. Um, in March 2020, you find that um, the number of minutes uh, spent on watching news has gone up to 1,800 uh, and the total views um, has also gone up tremendously. If you look at these percentage increase, which are even more um, telling, is that between February and March, it has gone up by 16%. You know, as the crisis deepens and as countries go into lockdown and other restrictions, news consumption has gone up tremendously. Uh, people are also looking for general news. Business news has gone up tremendously as well, plus 61% pandemic period. And uh, the time spent on assessing news has also significantly gone up and uh, through various devices. Um, and different countries, the, the increase is quite significant. For example, in US, uh, the increase uh, over March 2019 and March 2020 um, in US, it's 215% increase uh, in time spent online on mov mobile, uh, mobile devices assessing current events and global news. Uh, now, the other point about traditional media that you should note is that during this period, news sources and news media are now seen to be more trustworthy more trustworthy than social media. So in a survey done by Reuters Institute uh, in earlier this year, and the results came out in uh, mid-April, you find that more people are relying on news organizations because they think these are credible and trustworthy sources of information on COVID-19. Okay, so if you trust a source, then certainly it will also lead to higher consumption of those media platforms. And trust in media is also at an all-time high as shown by the Edelman Trust Barometer, which uh, was released in June. And the figures are from January to May 2020. One of the significant things that you see in this uh, chart is that traditional media has gone up by 69% in terms of trust in the source. And this has moved up from a 61, sorry, from a 62 to 69 in May 2020. That's a seven percentage point increase over this five months. And if you look at um, social media, it has increased by about 4%. Your own media platforms, that's your own Facebook, your Twitter feed, your website, and so on, your own media, it's gone up by 
8%. So what this shows is that trust, trust in traditional media, media has gone up tremendously. And likewise, trust in organizations' own platform media, uh, sorry, own media has also gone up by 8%. So that's pretty high. And so you should be, as you are communicating in the new norm, you have to see how you could take advantage of this situation because there's so much trust in these platforms. How could I make use of these platforms to reach my target audience? Yeah. So let me just uh, make a few key points here. One, you can see that media consumption by television channels and newspapers are at very high levels. Uh, media channels are seen as trusted sources of information based on very recent surveys. And they provide a very captive audience for marketers. And in this space, people search for content. You know, they have a particular purpose and they will look for specific content in that media space and in the social and digital space. So, however, when you are doing any kind of advertising on these platforms, the question is, should you do it as per normal? Or should you change your approaches as you advertise and try to reach your stakeholder groups? The shift should be from a marketing focus for your brand and think about in this new norm, how you could serve the needs of your consumers, how you could achieve certain objectives, how you could support national efforts and national narratives in the fight against COVID-19. So in other words, don't do hard sell in this new norm, but think about how you can position your brand carefully to serve a need, to serve an objective, to show that your brand messaging falls into certain themes like charitable relief, frontline assistance to uh, frontline workers, reinforce some of the public health messages, uh, and even promote uh, an advantage that, that you offer or um, support digital reinvention. So it could be in any of these themes, but you should be really shifting from a marketing focus for your brand. And in, the, in this way, you will adopt perhaps a different approach and the right approach for the new normal. So with that, come to some quick pointers that I want to make in this presentation. I hope uh, to get a lot more questions from you later and uh, I'll be happy to have a very robust discussion. Thank you.